Good morning, members. I welcome you on early morning with a very important topic and very important and renowned speaker, C.S. Sunil Pai Gawawala. We welcome you, sir. Today's topic, it is being how to interpret the or to understand the financial statement in the context of GST. Before we start the today's sessions and before we discuss this topic a little bit in detail, we start our today's sessions session with the our institute motor song. So we request all the members to please rise for our institute motor song. शु जागृति यशस्ु जागृति काम 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 शो पुषो निर्मीमाण निर्मीमाण तदेवशुक्रम तदेवशुक्रद ब्रह्मा तद ब्रह्मा Now we'll play our national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha चल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे Thank you, members. So to, to start the today's topic and the heading what the speakers are selected. It's a very relevant for the of the time. Reason being, whether you may call it tax audit, you may call it your income tax ICDS, or you may call it a GST compliances. Now it's the time to reconcile everything before you close your books of account. And with this fact, the topic of the day, it's a very important and relevant. And on this very important topic, we are having a very eminent speaker who can enlighten us on a, this important topic. So we welcome you, Sunil Bhai Gabawala, with a round of applause. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation. So now, without taking much more of time to formally introduce the today's speaker, I would like to invite our core group member, CA Bhavesh Bhai Shah, to formally introduce uh, today's speaker.
Thank you for giving me opportunity, uh, JB Nagar uh, core group member and uh, uh, convener uh, to introduce Sunil Bhai Gabawala. Sunil Bhai Gabawala is a renowned member of the Institute of Chartered Accountant in India and, and having a very vast experience in indirect taxation and specifically in GST, he is one of the authority to, means even department also ask guidelines from the Sunil Bhai Gapawala. And with uh, this short presentation, uh, I request Sunil Bhai Gapawala to come and we welcome him now. Before we start the session, I would like to invite our founder, Karnana. This, because he is Sunil Bhai Gabawala, he did not require any introduction. So, because of that, we are... A very good morning to each one of you. It's a pleasure to be back uh, at a physical interaction. Of course, JB Nagar, I have been uh, uh, a regular faculty and uh, more importantly, I, I am a member of the JB Nagar City Study Circle. And, uh, it's always a pleasure. I think I recognize most of you by your faces and names. And uh, that warmth is what uh, brings me here again and again. So when I was invited uh, after a hiatus of two years, wherein also we had some virtual sessions. So we, I was told that we now plan to start back in physical mode. And uh, so I was requested to uh, take this session. Uh, I was uh, okay to take this session and interact with you once again. And the topic as uh, rightly talked about in the initial comments is uh, really a very interesting topic. And uh, we see that today, the life of a chartered accountant has more become more like reconciliation. And uh, even uh, in the casual talk around the TV, uh, before this, there was a discussion that we have forgot that chartered accountant has two words, chartered and accountant, and we have converted ourselves into accountants. And I think uh, that aptly summarizes the mood of most of the uh, fellow professionals. And uh, there are a number of reasons why it has happened. I don't want to go into them. But yes, day in and day out, we see more and more obligations on professionals to try to marry different disjoint sets of data. And essentially that is the problem. Everything and anything can be reconciled. But the question is whether there is a need to reconcile is a larger policy question. A very recent uh, development is the tax audit uh, report where we have an uh, entry 44, which has, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which has been introduced. Of course, it has been there since three years, but it was postponed. And now it has been uh, notified from this year. The question which really comes up is we need to ask, what is the purpose of that? And that is what I think as professional bodies, we will have to somewhere 
sanitize the government to see that what is the objective of what you are asking does it really serve any purpose or is it just one more excel sheet which one will prepare maybe spend sleepless nights for preparing it and submit it which the assessing officer will not understand head and tail of it you see that right they not understand the head and tail of it and uh, they will struggle to understand you will have to educate them so that they understand understanding also that they are not interested in understanding so that leads to more and more unnecessary litigation well be as it may i think one is of course the policy direction where we are moving towards and the second is yes end of the day if we objectively ask anything can be reconciled and if it has it can be reconciled you should reconcile and if that be the scenario taking it as things which are there and which we as lesser mortals i would say are bound to comply with the dictates of the government and the regulatory bodies one important interesting facet which comes is everything and anything surrounds itself around a financial statement and financial statements are prepared based on certain fundamental principles and most of the cases we find these principles are very different than the principles relating to taxation unlike income tax where we clearly say that net profit as per profit and loss account is our starting point and there is a statutory backing for it in terms of the law itself gst has nothing like that we do 9c we do reconciliation but where in the act is it said that your sales as per financial statements will be taken as factor side or the starting point subject to certain adjustments there is nothing because the gst law is totally divorced from accounting except one or two places where we talk about capitalization and differential tax treatment based on capitalization there is absolutely nothing in gst law which say that your tax liability is created based on the sales reported income what they were what they were there is some noise ah no it's from here it's from the i think the zoom platform adi someone is unmuted on the mute plan so plan the map which map hai zoom mein hai na theek hai andar se just make sure that everybody else is zoom muted on the zoom platform yeah. so the point which we are trying to make is that when we look at gst as compared to income tax there is nothing which links the reporting in income uh, in the G, uh, financial statements with the gst liability and yet time and again we are asked to reconcile between apples and oranges we have to start a journey from an apple and convert it into an orange and where are the difficulties we all faced it over the last 5 years whenever we did 99c but i thought let's today revise some of those areas and try to understand what are the root causes of those areas and what are the ways in which one will look at it both from a perspective of an accountant as well as a perspective from a gst tax consultant that's what i think today's session is all about let's start with the first set of basic principles on financial statements all of us are aware of these fundamental principles the key objective of a financial statement is to present a true and fair view of the financial position of an entity and this i think is all of us as elite chartered accountants know this very well it's generally based on an account entity concept now this is where our first struggle starts you typically have a balance sheet for a legal entity you have a pnl account for a legal entity there is no mandate despite many people saying it otherwise there is no mandate under the gst law to maintain a state level financial record some entities might have it some entities might have a location driven uh, financial statements some may have a segment driven financial statements but as a legal obligation none of the enactments obliges a person to maintain a state level financial record and 
Of course, I'm aware some of the state officers say that you are required to maintain a state level trial balance and things like that. But I could not read anything like that in the entire uh, law. Even if you look at uh, the clarification given at the time of introduction of GSTR 9C reconciliation, it has been clearly stated that if it is not available from the financial statements, then the state level turnover will be derived from the financial statements. Now, when we are talking about entity concept, please understand you have to now, as tax professionals, deal with different sets of tax revenue collectors. In the past, as service tax, and I'm sure many of us have graduated from service tax to GST. And in service tax, typically, we have been able to acclimatize ourselves with the tax authorities. They have a particular way of dealing with it, central tax authorities. But when it comes to state tax authorities, for them, firstly, services is something new, which is what is a major part of most of our practices. A second thing which is new is accounting and finance. And therefore, one will have to be very, very careful. And this is where that accountant kage chartered becomes important. Many a times, we've seen this thing happen in one of the situations. When an audit starts, they say, provide me the financial statements. Right? That's the first checklist. This entity had a very glossy printed annual report. And we understand the difference between a financial statement and an annual report. Nobody did any thought process. Pura annual report ja ke de Usme first few pages ke aaya, consolidated financial statements, which showed an extra turnover. Now, naturally, the assessment was for one entity and that too from the state of Maharashtra. I can tell you it took a lot of time for the person, okay, the so called inter in house accountant, to explain to the authorities. That there's a difference between a consolidated financial statement and a standalone financial statement. Some of you might have faced it. It's really difficult. I think you could have dipped the controversy in the mud. When he asks for a financial statements, you could have given only the standalone financial statements. Yes, there's a reporting obligation somewhere else under the Companies Act, wherein you prepare an annual report which includes a consolidated financial statement. But unless specifically asked for, Perhaps this issue can be avoided. And that's where you need to move ourselves from the, what you can say, the role of an, what we have ourselves reconciled to. We have reconciled ourselves to being an accountant. We have reconciled ourselves to be a, being a postman. We need to change that. And maybe it's the same work, but if as a professional, we are able to really apply our mind to the relevance of each document which is being asked and the possible issues which can arise out of that. Maybe that is what is going to add value to you and is going to add value to your clients. So that is where I think this concept of entity becomes very important. We can keep on talking a lot about the department mindset, their inability to understand it. We've seen notices where they are not able to understand overseas subsidiary versus overseas branch. And then they deny export benefits based on that saying that, look, these are distinct establishments of the same, same entity. Not understanding that this is a subsidiary and subsidiary is a separate legal entity and not a distinct establishment of the same legal entity. So some of these things, perhaps with a little bit of more care in our submissions, I'm not saying it will be totally eradicated, but maybe we can reduce some of the hardships on those accounts on that. Thing. So that is one aspect which we need to bear in mind. When we look at financial statements, it's of, as we all know, as based on some key concepts, we always studied this as fundamentals of accounting. And we see that just like the word accounting is divorced from the GST law, many of these concepts are totally divorced from the GST law itself. And that's where we find needs for reconciliation, disjoint data sets coming. And the first basic principle is capital versus rent. We all understand this very well. But as far as GST is concerned, it is concerned with supply. Supply can be of capital items, supply can be of revenue items. It's least concerned with that. Inward supply also can be of capital. Inward supply can be of revenue. And therefore, you always have, you start with your sales, you add items from your balance sheet, you then do uh, take credits relating to balance sheet uh, acquisition of fixed assets, etc. More or less people to understand this point. Yes, there is a challenge on that 
uh, aspect of construction related credits where we are told that based on capitalization or non capitalization either the credit remains blocked or is eligible for credit but that's a very specific type of a situation which does come in otherwise as far as generally the gst law is concerned we are not concerned with capitalization versus revenue treatment as far as the books of accounts is concerned next is important prudence and this is somewhere where as time progresses we will find some litigation coming the accounting principles work on the concept of prudence conservatism it's ingrained into it and based on that even if there is a possible likelihood of a loss we always are required to make a provision for a loss inventory write offs provisions impairment of assets these are all accounting concepts which require you to write down the value of an asset without a transaction ideally this should not have any gst implication because gst is on a supply the implications of gst starts on a supply which is a transaction driven law and when you just do a unilateral act of writing down some asset or writing down an inventory it should ideally not have implications under gst but couple of things which we need to bear in mind one is section 175 where we are told that if there are any goods on which you have claimed credit and they are either lost we all understand this word comma return off so one will have to interplay these two aspects when you are writing off goods or assets in your books of accounts there would be a corresponding exposure towards an input tax credit reverse so that is one aspect which one needs to bear in mind when we look at this principle of conservatism and write off of you know assets or writing down the value of an asset to reflect the fair value another important aspect which comes out from this aspect of write off and writing it down to a particular value is a scenario that at a future point of time you may require to write it back because in the first year your value has gone down from 1 lakh to 80000 so you have written it down by 20000 next year the value comes back to 90000 or bounces back to that level so you will write it back you will write back that 10000 now these write backs are something which many a times you find queries coming up from the department moment they see some credit item in your pnl account it's their antenna of the department starts raising they always start asking you ki why are you having this credit side and practically we have seen this situation that while on a piece of paper or on a speech like this we can say okay write back so there was 100 there is a write back of 20 right write off of 20 there is a write back of 10 all these three happen in very very different financial years and many a times all of this happens on an aggregate level and therefore when the officer says okay you are saying this write back of 10 is out of a write off of 20 please demonstrate each of these transactions trace the history back and many a times we find it difficult to trace back that history because again we might have worked on materiality and in materiality we might have some working notes auditors might have changed consultants might have changed maybe it's a 5 7 years journey and that starts creating a problem one more is aspect from write offs especially bad debts written off in the context of exports we have to be a bit careful there are now provisions where you are told that in case of exports you have to require to realize the money in convertible foreign exchange within a period of one year and if you have not realized the convertible foreign exchange within one year you have to pay back a refund which was given to you at the time of exportation your act of writing off a bad debt clearly brings to forth the fact that you have not realized the currency because i am aware that in some cases organizations do reverse or pay back the refund but in many cases this is observed more by non compliance and compliance but the moment you have a bad debts written off from your export receivables it clearly glaringly brings out the aspect to the forefront and this is also one area where i think a checking may be required either as an accountant or as a gst consultant whichever ways you look at it whatever hat you are wearing but this is something again which will be important that takes me to the next uh, principle substance over form 
And again, when you look at substance over form, accounting standard very clearly says you might legally do a transaction in a particular way, but you will ultimately look at a substance. What does GST law say? It looks at supply. Supply is based on a contract, which is a legal terminology. And therefore, the GST law works on form over substance. Except wherever the government finds that there's a lot of loss of revenue, they will apply McDowell's. They will say this is a tax avoidance scheme. And therefore, they will somewhere try to ignore the form and look at the substance. But primarily, as a first point, unless there is a rampant tax evasion, as a first point, the tax implications will be decided by form rather than substance. Let me give you one live example. Let us say an organization undertakes a contract on a concession basis. You are aware of the BOT model and it's very famous nowadays. So let's say somebody takes up a contract for construction of road on a BOT model. The entire investment is done by that entity. And against that investment, it is given a, a right to collect toll for a period of 30 years. That toll is exempted. That's another story. Now, typically, how? what is the legal form of the transaction? The legal form of the transaction is that the entity builds this asset. And using that asset, it provides a service for a period of 30 years. The question which comes up is, there is now a accounting standard, which says that at the start, you have to notionally amortize or identify the value of the contracting activity. Technically, if you look at the legal form, the contracting role, the building role of that entity and the operating and the maintenance role of that entity is interlinked. And you cannot divert it based on the legal. You can't just build a road and say that's the end of it. He's not going to get a single rupee. The money he gets is from the toll collections, which is through the operations over the next 30 or 50 years. So they are interlinked. That is the form, the legal form of the transaction. But accounting standard streets looks at the substance. It tries to divide the role of this entity into two parts. It says for the constructing part, assuming that there was a 900 crore of an investment done by this entity, you recognize 900 crores as a notional construction revenue and treat it as a receivable in the balance sheet. And then every year, as you recollect your tolls, you knock off that receivables and then there's some financing element involved in it. And accordingly, there's a detailed elaborate guidance given through the accounting standards. I can tell you now, none of the tax offices are understanding this. The basic disconnect here is there's a difference between the way accounting standards look at it. They look at the substance over form, whereas the GST law looks at the form over substance. Now, when you do this type of a thing, in one year, your balance sheet shows a notional construction revenue of 800 crores. And when you do a 9C, you will say in days adjustment 800 crores. When the matters come up for assessment, it's going to be a tough time to explain this. Of course, it will have to be explained and there's nothing wrong in this entire process. But this is where again, this aspect of explaining the differing objectives between GST and accounting standards will come into place. Same way when you look at materiality, this is one thing which I always keep on sensitizing the tax. We, when it comes to accounting, we always look at materiality and say that, okay, there's a threshold. And of course, at times people use it as a loose handle also, because anything which is missed out is always missed out in the name of materiality or non-materiality of amounts. But compare that with another extreme, when you look at a GST law, we've seen people getting notices. And now with this age of systems generated notices and computerization, we receive notices to say that you are not paid interest of three rupees or two rupees. Mind you, the cost of collection of these two rupees is much more than that. But well, that's how the GST law does not understand materiality at all. For them, everything is a principle. And more importantly, at the time of audit, if they find one example of, let's say, a food credit which you have taken, which is a block credit, they will want you to go through one lakh items and say that, okay, aapka ek mila hai, aur nahi hoga, uska kya hai. Now, please explain each transaction. Now, that's a mindset change, which perhaps, again, is required from a legal perspective.
going concern of course we are all aware that if uh, entity is not a going concern there are reporting requirements under the audit report moment you are not a going concern someone might think okay theek hai wo audit ne report kar diya not a going concern main to mera gstr 1 aur gstr 9 bana ke bhej raha hu what are the implications of something not some if an entity not being a going concern from a gst one of the reasons of not being a going concern is of course losses and we say that because of financial position it is not a going concern but what it also means is either it has discontinued business or is in the process of discontinuing a business moment a business is discontinued you are not entitled to have a gst registration there are provisions which say that on discontinuation of business you have to cancel your registration if you have accumulated input tax credits those input tax credits get lapsed so that is those are some challenges you know when we read balance sheets and someone might just say your assets are less than the liabilities and there are losses and therefore there is a reporting requirement of going concern but those reporting requirements of going concerns can have challenges on the gst front which we need to be careful about consistency again yes with the one one of the basic principles and accrual accrual is something which we have faced day in and day out at the end of each year we keep on doing reconciliations of unbuilt uh, revenue and work in progress and things like that so that is as far as some basics of financials coming to gst front we are all aware that the whole objective of gst or any tax law for that matter would be collection of tax but at the same time with minimum cascading effect and minimum intervention now while we say this in practice we see both of these things getting diluted by the tax authorities and by the law also broadly divided the gst law has three important touch points one is taxation of outward supplies and the output tax there on inward supplies input tax which partially can become input tax credit or it may not become input tax credit and then there are inward supplies which are liable for reverse tax mechanism and then we'll speak a little bit about documentation and procedures uh, attached to the gst law linked with the accounting and financial statements so now we have a few slides on each of these aspects and we'll try to just touch upon some of the principles and of course all of this to a large extent is now a revision for most of you so yeah, what i suggest is as we go through these slides if there are any inputs or any questions from your side you can take it up let's keep it up bit of an interactive session so that what we can do is you know uh, it can be useful and uh, you know every point can be covered in this aspect because all of this is just a revision of what you all have been doing on a day to day basis so on the outward supply side of course we always start with the revenue from operations we touched upon the first aspect about the jurisdiction level slicing now two or three facets here one is of course we talked about the uh, requirement of reconciliation of your financial turnover with the state level government we have seen some states starting sending notices on these matters uh, especially i understand karnataka telangana their states have started comparing the pan based turnover with the gst and turnover of that state and then they are issuing uh, emails and letters to say like what we had in you know so, uh, service tax versus tds those types of notices have started now two three things one is i think in the responses to these notices we need to first attack the jurisdictional bit it's one thing when you are looking at service tax and tds because they are pan india laws you are you are looking a state level law vis a vis a pan or india or rather a global domain what is the onus of the tax payer is a I mean, this is a question which i want to keep it an open question for uh, the group to discuss what is the onus of a tax payer let us say my karnataka turnover is 5 crores i have filed an inc of 5 crores my audited financial statement shows a turnover of 140 crores what is the onus of the tax payer burden of proof i'm going on that legal concept of burden of proof to establish that 5 crores added with every other state totals up to 140 crores any idea any input yeah only which i have done so that should be our first defense many a times we take too much obligation on ourselves saying this is because there can be so many other facets and yeah, we have seen state tax uh, 
assessments in the past pre GST. And at that time, I think this was something which was more or less acceptable. Nobody used to, uh, you know, look at an annual uh, global uh, financial statements and look at reconciliations. They used to restrict themselves, and at times, they, at the most, they would say, Ki ye state level ka turnover mujhe certify kar de by some accountant or yeah, maybe some officers will insist that it has to be done by standard. Level. Up to that, if I, I, I need to establish that five rows is command. So I might, they might say that give me a certification of five crores. But saying that no, five crores, Maharashtra mein 10 crores, Gujarat mein three crores, aisa kar kar ke 140 crores. Ka. See, the moment you do this, the next step is, is going to say, Achha, Maharashtra mein 10 crores, uska nine CV. Or if Maharashtra mein 10 crores is as per financials, right? As per nine C, it will be 12 crores. And we all know the number of reasons. So we will then start asking you, to explain the reconciliation of Maharashtra. The Karnataka officer will then start asking you reconciliation and entries in Maharashtra. So are we then saying that if you are a multi-locational entity having 20, 30 registrations, your assessment is open or pan India assessment is open for all the 20, 30 authorities. So that is, I think as professionals, we will have to put our foot down. We will have to say that this is what it is. And sometimes I think I'm sure when I'm saying this, some of you will say, Are yes, I'm bolne ko to acha lagta hai, wo to notice dal ke demand raise karne ki. I can tell you way back in uh, 2003, 4, we were stuck with one interesting proposition notice again from the state of Karnataka. At that point of time, that in, that proposition notice is like your ASMT 10, something like that. They tried to propose a tax demand based on the balance sheet. And that tax demand was coming to around 9,000 crores. We just took one reference point. We took the Karnataka state budget and the budgeted revenue from tax collections available in the public domain. It was 6,000 crores. For the entire state, the estimated revenue, I'm talking about 2004, Estimated state tax collection was 6,000 crores, and there was a proposition notice of 8,000 crores. We just highlighted this factor to the commission. The proposition notice was dropped. So, somewhere I think we'll have to connect these types of dots. Wherever we see, and, and I, these things are going to happen. We are all and we are all experiencing these types of things. One is, of course, we at sometimes we'll have to go into defensive. But sometimes we will have to go into offensive. And when we are going to offensive, we'll have to think about this type of innovative uh, reasons or justifications for what has been done. To demonstrate the absurdity of the proposition notice, I think there couldn't be anything better than saying that we are expecting one taxpayer to pay much more than your entire state's tax budget. And if you do something like this naturally, please understand today's age is an age of uh, you know, activism, judicial activism. We are seeing day in and day out strictures passed by the high courts. And therefore, when you respond, I don't need to every time go and knock the high court. But if your response is, if you are bringing these flavors, the tax authorities sense that no, this person or this taxpayer knows his rights. He is well thought about. And therefore, if he acts funny, then the matter can go to the courts. And then there can be some strictures against them. So I think these are some points which we need to bear in mind. International turnover and two aspects over there. There may be branches overseas and there will be turnover of those branches. Which state will you show that? These are questions which keep on coming me and with due respect, I see many GST so experts talking on WhatsApp or in YouTube. And somewhere there's a thought process that if there is a Ultimately, all the total turnover has to be matched with your financials. Okay, so if you have 20 GSTNs and your turnover is, let us say, 20 crores, between 20 GSTNs, your 20 crores has to match. I think that is the biggest fallacy. If you have 20 GSTNs, they are Indian GSTNs. You might have two branches overseas. Now, you cannot, by force, bring the branch turnover into one of these 20 GSTNs. That is... I would feel a fundamental error in the law and in accounting. 
the law itself says that an overseas establishment will be treated as a distinct establishment. If it's a distinct establishment, where will you show? It's not one of these 20 at all. What many would say is show it in the corporate office, head office, registered office, etc. But then it's not that entity's turnover. So why are you exposing that turnover for scrutiny? That is a question which we need to think. Well, I'm sure one more question which always comes up is schedule three transactions. Especially you have something called as high seas sale. You have sale from a bonded warehouse, which now is defined under schedule three clearly as neither a supply of goods nor a supply of service. Where will it go? Could it be a part of one of these 20 GST? This is a question. Any outside the scope. So will it be a part of any of the GSTR 9s? Will it be a part of GSTR 3B? I'm aware that many people are having a different disclosure practice. Now the point is, it's okay to say I'm a table, but the moment you put things in a table, you are attracting attention and unnecessary questions from the department. So this is what one will have to be slightly careful about as far as the jurisdictional level slicing is concerned. Discounts, provisions, we've talked a lot about it in the past also. Pre-supply discounts, post-supply discounts. Provisions, reversals of provisions. Let me tell you, in larger organizations, accountants and tax teams don't talk to each other. creates n number of difficulties. They have provisions they, and most of these provisions are not in their SAPs or ERPs. There are some Excel sheets and at a later point of time when you have to slice those provisions across the 30 states. Because when you create a provision, you are only looking at a statutory audit. And most of the time these provisions are done at an entity level. So if you do a provision at an entity level, when you are doing a reconciliation, you have a challenge. We had a very interesting scenario. Last week, uh, there was a concept of this cutoff sales, which has been there in accounting principles since long. You raise invoices on the last week of the last uh, week of the financial year, and the deliveries are yet to happen. In that case, it comes in your sales, but then you have to provide for this because it's actually not your sale. The accounting standard says that until the delivery happens, the transfer of title doesn't happen. And therefore, you cannot account the sale or the profit thereby. So typically, you'd make a provision for these cutoff sales, and it's reversed on the first day of the next year. You don't pass individual credit codes or things like that, but there's a general provision for cutoff sales being passed. The question which comes is whether you will do this provision for cutoff sales at an entity level, or whether you will have to do it at an individual state level. Because typically, the invoices through which this cutoff is coming is available at a state level. And therefore, these types of provisions, what will have to be sensitized that, okay, when I have to ultimately file 9C, as to have 2022 ka balance sheet signed, so when I'm going to do a 99C, it's going to be tough. So those types of things, I think there has to be a little bit of more sensitization on these types of aspects. Unbuilt revenues, advances, again, similar. Many a times we see these are not tracked to individual states or individual jurisdiction and starts creating problems. And in days adjustment, I've already given you one example of concessional arrangements. But many a times these in days adjustments, of course, the objectives are very noble. But at times we are finding that even not only from a tax perspective, but from an accounting and an auditing perspective also, there's a lot of over regulation or over VH. And uh, so, therefore, there are many cases where. You have long, long statements of comprehensive income, non other non-comprehensive income, and then explaining all of that. So a little bit of sensitization to that front also will be useful. I think other points uh, we are aware of the concepts of other income and drilling down the other income to those specific areas, like identifying the scrap sales, fixed asset sales. Now, again, when you are looking at some types of fixed assets, there's a margin scheme in fixed as some of the fixed assets. So you might be looking at that margin and then Accordingly, there is a valuation issue which comes in on that. Interest, of course, will be a part of your GST turnover because it's treated as an exempt consideration for the activity of lending. 
Now, of course, interest we are aware is a part of a consideration, but certain other aspects like a dividend and all is not a part of consideration. It will not get reported anyway. I think there's already an advanced ruling. I was really surprised that somebody had to file an advanced ruling application to understand that dividend is not a consideration. But anyways, the, we have that, so we are now very clear about it. When you are doing all this, we also need to understand that there will be items which don't go into your P&L, but would still be a part of your GST turnover, especially in cases where you are treating yourself as not satisfying the pure agent test. You might be an intermediary, you might be claiming reimbursement of expenditure, and maybe one of the eight tests you can choose to claim input tax credit and you are charging GST, but your accounting principles will not permit you to treat it as your top line. So you are netting out the expenditure or taking it through a balance sheet. So all those areas will come into place when you are doing a reconciliation of your outward supplies. So I think this is what we've learned over the last four or five years as far as GST outward reconciliation 9C is concerned. Any specific aspects any of the members here has in terms of questions on this outward reconciliation? How many of us, I mean, I'm sure many of you have done 9C earlier. How many of us have really gone into reconciliation of output tax? Outward supply is one thing. It's important. I'm sure many would have done, but we did see these statutory audit reports where output tax liability is continuously continuing for four years. Input tax credit is continuously keeping on adding for four years. In the balance sheet, both they are knocked off because they are in the same grouping. But if you really take out a ledger, output tax liability has an opening balance which is continuing. So today, if you look at that balance here, balance, you know, individual GLs, you will find output tax liability of 300 crores, input tax credit of around 300 crores or 280 crores. Technically, at the end of each month, you should insist that the client offsets these entries. It's important because there is also a school of thought and uh, depending on how things go, department would like to use this school of thought to say that input tax credit is available and utilized in your books of accounts. And they would say that you have availed the credit, but you are not utilizing it. Just like you do an offset entry in your GST or PB, it's important that an offset entry gets reflected in your accounting statements also. Now, I, we have seen this in some reasonably large companies, including one listed company, that this type of a cumulative account. And when we asked them, they said, okay, ultimately, both of them are a part of the same group. So grouping may not be a debit, a credit, a net out. But there's no journal entry passed in the books of accounts to knock off or offset. So I think that is an important facet which will come out if you do an output tax reconciliation. So that is an important facet. Yeah. Sure, please. No way. No, so when you're starting p &L, assuming this is a multi-state entity, you will start with a number which is a derived number. The derived number itself will not include ICs. Just like it does not include foreign branches. So again, coming back to the uh, concept through a numerical example, if my balance sheet has a turnover of 20 minutes, okay, my Maharashtra turnover out of that is, I don't have to start with 20 crores. I will start with the Maharashtra turnover. When I'm starting with the Maharashtra turnover, I will not include ICs in the Maharashtra turnover. Okay. If it is specifically appearing as a, you know, if you have a separate Maharashtra trial balance where you, as a part of your accounting process, you have included it there, then you will show it as an adjustment in 9C. Yeah, 9C, not in 9. Not in 9C. Huh. As a. As, as non supply. Perfect. In, in fact, in many of our cases, what we have suggested them is to create a virtual warehouse. For all these types of high seas and bonded sales, create a virtual warehouse under a separate business place. So technically, these types of things become one more trial balance. 
and so it does not get cluttered in any of the 20 states. Because see, again, what happens is you are assuming it is in Maharashtra. Now, practically, what you've seen is in case, of, especially in case of contracting companies, the high seas can be related to three or four states depending on the project where the where the project is located. So then, in each of the states, you have those exposure of you know whether this is high seas, AO, and all those types of questions coming in. Especially when it's not a part of the scope, I don't think we should really go into that. It's better to treat it as a virtual warehouse, take it out, rather than disclose it anyway. Yeah, if it's a one-off transaction and if, if in your facts, if it is actually reflecting in a Maharashtra, there's a separate Maharashtra trial balance and it's reflecting within that terminal, then you will show it as a non-supply in 9C, not in 9. Yes. Yes, in fact, that's one of the points which I want to touch on. That uh, is there in the subsequent slide, but since it's come up, I'll teach it right now. Is that the, uh, while many a times auditors do really look at you know electronic credit ledger, we've seen cases where electronic cash ledger is missed out. There might be a small balance in electronic cash ledger, but it doesn't appear in the balance sheet. So when an entity pays, let's say one lakh as tax, it actually there are two steps in that tax payment. That first goes in your electronic cash ledger, and then maybe ninety nine thousand eight hundred is offset towards payment of tax. But we've seen organizations and even again large organizations straight away treating one lakh as a debit to GST. So that's not correct. It's more like you electronic cash ledger is one more bank account which the entity has. Created as a bank account, when you actually remit the funds, it has to go as a contra to that bank account. And when based on the GSTR 3B offset entry, offset the output tax liability against the input credit to the extent offset against ECL and offset the amount against ECL to the extent it is used. And the electronic cash ledger closing balance should match with the GSTR. GST records of the electronic cash ledger balance. And we've seen in 90% cases, this ECL, ECR appears because it's a balancing figure in your electronic in your input tax credit ledger. But ECL we've seen, maybe the amounts are not big, but ultimately it's a cash balance. And just like you have a bank account, you have to account a bank account in books. Even if it's a 500 rupee balance, materiality concept will not take you out in not disclosing a bank account in your balance sheet. This is a, indirectly a bank account. So as a statutory auditor, it's important for you to bring this electronic cash ledger balance into your balance sheet. Sure. Yes. I would, I have asked this to many auditors. Most auditors have been clueless on this. It's an event which is a subsequent to a balance sheet date, uh, but it gives indication of the events on the balance sheet date. Therefore, you will pass an entry on the 31st for the offset, end of the month for the offset. That is my interpretation. But when I ask this to many audit experts, I'm not getting, I mean, many of them are not even aware of the issue at that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. After this. Yeah, please. Yes, a very important question. That's this deemed supply. There is one a few aspects, and this is also one of the aspects. If I am an agent, the GST law says that an agent can discharge a liability on behalf of principal. Happens very frequently. Of course, many of the product related agency transactions people have adapted to a sale transaction, but this happens very frequently in services. For example, if you are an overseas uh, shipping line, you might have a steamer agent in India. In these types of situations, you will have a GST turnover, which is actually not your accounting turnover. It's the accounting turnover of the principal, but as an agent, your GSTR1 will show that turnover. So this will again become a part of your 9C. Please note, this can't become your accounting term. Accounting principles will not allow you to treat it as your term. 
So it will again be a 9C adjustment, just like branch transfer is a 9C adjustment. This will also be a 9C adjustment. Accounts principal will show, and both of them will show this as a 9C adjustment. Assuming principal also is in India, both of them will show this as a 9C adjustment. Yeah, you are you are a question. Yeah. No, no, here I'm not talking about the legality of the levy. Yeah. So we are doing Yeah. So as I said, when I'm putting this slide, it's accounting GST interplay. It's not on the legal position of GST applicability. As far as GST applicability on canteen recovery is notice pay, I think there is a strong view to say that no GST is payable. And various reasons. Notice pay, though, recently there's a, they have clarified through a circular also that uh, does not fit within that entry agreeing to do a toll return act. But having said that, we have seen that many organizations, especially these amounts, are not material. So many organizations have taken a very, very conservative view and collected and paid the tax. If you have collected and paid the tax, it will become a part of the consideration. If you have taken a position that no, these are not liable for GST at all, which is a very strong and a defendable position, then the question of it coming into reconciliation does not exist. I hope I have answered your there was something from that. that that is irrelevant whether it is compulsory or not compulsory is irrelevant the for this we'll have to go to the understanding of what is meant by a supply and i would today is not the right time for that but i will only urge you to read one decision again it's not very uh, you know often quoted or a popular decision is by mamu by trust of the bombay high court it was an interesting judgment where the issue was the tax liability on port liquidators. And therefore, it's not got too much attention. Because somebody will say, how many are port liquidators and why should I go into that? But in the process, they have actually, the court has, uh, has gone into understanding the crux of a supply. What is a supply? Because if you have to ask for a GST, there has to be a supply. And answering that question, you will find all the answers of that question in that document. It's a very classic judgment, which I would request Everyone who is interested in a long-term practice in indirect tax should read that judgment. Yeah, there was some question on the back. Agents. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So again, just like I answered the earlier question, you will show it as an ad adjustment in your 9C. Uh, here we are seeing two variations, especially foreign shipping lines is a bit tricky. Uh, there are situations where the agent in the same registration is discharging his agency tax as well as principal tax. There is another situation where there are two registrations. One agent registration, one principal registration, but operated by the agent. Now, if that is the scenario, naturally there will be a different set of challenges in that. Because again, the question which comes is when we have to prepare a 9C for one of these entities, the 9C, the uploading has to be of an audited financial statement. Now, there is no requirement of an audit or the audit is by a foreign entity. So, therefore, there is a bit, bit of a challenge or a disconnect on this front over here. When you are actually at an operational level, Filing a GST or You can do that. You can do that. You look at the definition of the supplier under the GST law, it includes an agent. Yeah. Yes, please. Buy Mamu by Trust. Bombay High Court. 
Okay. So you are on this deemed supplies concept, and I think we've touched upon two specific examples of agency transactions. Similarly, you'll have aspects of branch transfer of goods, services, delayed job work return. Now, this is now coming up big time. In the first few years, naturally, uh, you know, there's a delaying effect because the law itself says that capital goods not returned within three years or inputs not returned within one year, and then you can seek an exchange. But all those timelines are now getting exhausted. And especially because of COVID, if you have a situation that a job worker is stuck with goods which are not returned back to the principal, then you have 143, which says that it will be deemed to be the supply on day one. Now, naturally, all these aspects are not going to come in your financials because this is all inventory related transactions and uh, it will not appear in your financials. So, in those cases, you will have to make sure that it becomes a part of your ad ad adjustment. Similarly, reverse supplies. Again, I don't subscribe to this view, but I'm aware that there's a huge uh, school of, I mean, a big school of thought, which was partially endorsed by a CBC circular that there can be a reverse supply. Now, I just, I'm, I'm used an acronym reverse supply. I'm sure all of us do understand this. In the case, context of pharma companies, they said that if I sell goods to a distributor, and the distributor returns the goods back. Somewhere that circular said that the distributor, there can be two ways of dealing with it. Either the principal can give a credit note or the distributor can raise a saving loss for not selling the goods back to the manufacturer, but for a rejection. That circular later on is withdrawn. But this is something which many people have found it very convenient in the time. And therefore, you practically see many situations of reverse supplies happening. I am a bit skeptical about this from both from a GST as well as an accounting perspective. From a GST perspective, clearly there is no supply by the distributor to the manufacturer. It's a rejection. It's a write back or return of goods. Therefore, Someone might say that there is no inward supply of goods to you. And the idea is distributor collects tax from the manufacturer, manufacturer claims the credit. And that claim of credit itself can be a big question at some point of time. And more importantly, when you do a sales instead of a goods rejection, you are adding turnover at both ends, distributor as well as the principal. Again, accounting principles will not permit you to do that. For example, if you are, let's say, if you are a pharma company and you are selling medicines, you don't want to say that my purchases are of medicines. Effectively, you are doing that by when you say the distributor sells you the medicines back. How can a distributor sell you back your own medicines? Your entire turn turnover, cost of goods sold, traded goods versus manufactured goods, everything can go topsy turvy. These are huge transactions. So one has to be a little bit careful about this concept of reverse supplies. I, because it is very prevalent in the industry, I thought I'd touch upon it. I'm not endorsing it in any manner. According to me, these are all, all cases of goods rejection are credit notes. Depending on timeline, either they are GST credit notes or a commercial credit note. But you cannot do a reverse supply for these types of transactions. Aggregator supplies, nowadays we have this restaurant and all aggregators paying taxes. So again, that will be a part of your adjustment entries in that. Sir, yeah. In case of uh, internet to reverse supply, what is the best option? Whether to uh, give a credit note or take an aggregator? No, no. You uh, So typically, GST law mm -hmm. understands every transaction vis-a-vis -vis the supply. So in this example, the correct way is the supplier raises a credit limit. Depending on section 34, it will be a GST credit note or a non-GST credit note. So there are timelines. We are aware of those timelines. If you satisfy those timelines, you will do a GST credit note. So you will say 100 GST 18 118. If the timelines have lapsed, you will do only 100 or 118 depending on commercial terms between the bank. No 18 rupees separately as a GST adjustment. So it is always better to take a credit note or issue a credit no, no, because you have to issue a credit note. A supplier will always issue a credit note, and that is a document which will be looked at. Now, for accounting purposes, 
many a times people will say i want to raise a debit note corresponding debit note wo sab alag hai and in fact it adds to the confusion so if yeah. you look at gst you link yourself only with the supplier that's how conceptually gst looks at links itself with the supplier as far as debit note credit note is concerned consider credit note only yes otherwise it can lead to confusion let's say if what happens is x raises a credit note he claims an adjustment in his gst r1 accordingly y who is a distributor he raises a debit note and he shows it as an outward supply by error maybe their systems are automated and then it goes in outward supply and all then it becomes a huge confusion so this anchor point is the supplier that we need to bear in mind okay so just a few minutes i thought we'll touch upon this overall flow and there you will find that there is a treasure of information 30 years ago when we did audit we did not have this information yes there were uh, accounting softwares there were erps but did we have an hsn level uh, turnover detail at that point of time today we have it the department may use it in some way or other but how as internal or statutory auditors are we in this point are we even looking at that infometric please understand the opportunities which come up in your internal audit and statutory audit space because of this gstn system we had an interesting uh, case where we were looking at one organization and looking at its hsn summary so most of its hsn was in a particular basket called 30 30 is basically a chemicals and pharmaceutical products and they are manufacturers into that so that's fine but a substantially huge amount was coming in 84 84 is appliances in electronic and mechanical appliances so we just asked you okay your nature of business is pharmaceutical so they said no there are some medical instruments and all which we have okay so have you set up a factory No, no, we are trading, and then when we went into it, there were just a select three or four entries of those trading. And when we did a bit of a deep dive, we did not find an economic rationale for those entries. And then you can connect the dots. So somewhere an HSN summary can give you information. which was never available and this information can be used to identify what in audit parlance we say outlier transactions and those finding of those outlier transactions at least can help you in focusing your audit or investigation in a bit of a better manner so that is what i thought we we'll, let's understand this entire chain you have an irn which is generated nowadays every literally every organization of reasonable size has to generate an irn that irn data auto flows into eweb is there a timing difference between these two if yes if there is a substantial timing difference why right. you have raised a sale invoice today so irn is dated let us say 21st of august and an eweb is generated on 30th of september what is the reason for this delay because technically the title transfers again coming back to the cut off sales example the title transfers when you deliver the goods are you preponing sales again a very common practice as auditors we know this by quarter end pressures month end pressures at least we know that yes this is the quantum of the misuse which is happening and then maybe as an auditor you can take a call on how do you want to deal with it but can we really look at this data it's now available in excel so just a few commands here or there and you can find out the gap between an irn and an eweb now many a times organizations might have separate commercial invoices so is there a difference between these two then coming to gstr 1 3b and ultimately gstr 9 this is the process flow gstr 9 then ultimately gets reconciled with your financial statement through gstr 9 so when you look at each of these touch points and we can look at this as queries and 
a more an accounting and a reconciliation job or we can really look at those reconciliation items because end of the day each of these reconciliation item is an outlier is a situation where there was an exception and if we just report the exception that's one thing but if we investigate the exception maybe we will find many more examples and qualitative advices which we can give to the clients on each of those fronts as far as inward supplies are concerned i think primarily from an input tax credit perspective the accounting systems will have to recognize but remove block credits now this is one major change which is coming because of a recent circular where uh, they have said that your starting point of input tax credit will be gst at 2b we are aware of the series of circulars which came a month ago of course they have not been implemented on the portal and there is a big question of the legal validity of that circular but for the time being what that circular says is every month there is a 2b credit which is proposed to you that 2b credit you claim everything and then reverse it into two baskets one is a temporary reversal for example the goods are in transit and therefore they have not been accounted in your system so it's a temporary reversal because actually you will get the credit in the next month or a permanent reversal something which is a, let's say a block credit something like a mediclaim insurance becoming a block credit now what the circular says is you start with to be and show both of these something practically what happens is in most of the organizations people expense of the entire amount including the gst component if it's a block credit so their tax codes are defined in a manner to say that if this is a block credit every amount goes into so if it's a medi claim for example so 100 rupees medi claim 80 rupees gst the entire 180 rupees goes into staff welfare now in a large and a complex organization finding that 80 rupees so as to show it separately as block credit is a challenge so that's where this first word recognize becomes important perhaps the systems will have to develop themselves to recognize one may debate the legality because if it's a block credit it's my choice whether i want to disclose it or i don't want to disclose it one can doubt one can really argue on legality but practically what happens is we need to understand that gst is a complex interplay of 30 government taxes and therefore there is a settlement mechanism internally and the moment you don't report a block credit they don't know whether this tax has to go to which state because end of the day the entire concept of your b2b versus b2c is that b2c taxes get apportioned finally amongst the tax governments whereas a b2b taxes stay just like it they stay in your asset account in as input tax credit they are a sort of a liability for the government which they will have to pay to someone else so typically their settlement mechanism across the 30 states and the center gets impacted if there is not proper reporting of block credit and that's the reason they have issued this circular i wouldn't be surprised that if we really shout too much on the legality of it they will amend the law because end of the day they need to give this money to some state so they have to find a solution what are we find its own way so they will amend the law maybe retrospectively to say that this is a compulsory requirement of uh, disclosure of block credit so rather than fighting on legality maybe whatever has happened has happened but moving forward we need to look at how we are going to recognize such block credit in our systems but at the same time we should have mechanism to say that these are not eligible so it will come out in the permanent reverses next step is matching eligible credits no accounting treatment will always be through expense but when it comes to the gst or 3b reporting you need to identify the figure and show it separately ha huh, why yeah when you do that let's say to be reflects this credit this much is blocked which many people were earlier saying many were not saying because anyways if they did claim they said i don't want to show it separately now they are saying you claim and show it separately yes it's not in accounting accounting it will always be gross it will have to be gross but disclosure now is till now people were okay but moving forward i think things will now get a bit trickier with this circular in place and therefore one will have to adapt their accounting systems accordingly that is the point which we wanted to make some 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 yes then whether this 
Yeah, yeah, so again, yeah, that's one more aspect that when you file a refund application, I've seen most entities do a JV, but sometimes if you're not done, you need to do a JV, you need to move the balance, uh, the refund amount claim from your credit layer asset to a refund receivable asset. You wait till the time there is an order. If you get the money back, it's clearly fine. If you don't get the money back, you have two options. Either you litigate ahead, in which case you'll keep it still in a disputed refund receipt. Huh. So now you have to decide whether for the rejected amount, you want to file an appeal or you want to file a claim or recredit. So they give you an option. If you take a recredit, you will move it back from your refund account to the credit account. If you are litigating it in an appeal, then you will continue in the refund till the time the appeal matter gets discussed. That is not possible. No. GST, you can't do it through GST 3 There is a document called PMT3, if I'm not mistaken. So the recredit, you have to write it to the officer that I'm not filing an appeal. And based on that undertaking, he will issue a PMT3 and the amount will get credited in the electronic credit. You can't take it through a normal three. Yes. Yes. So then you have this matching, matching of eligible credits. And this again, we know is a big nightmare. You have to defer unmatched credit. So typically when you are doing a accounting aspect, you need to bear in mind that your input tax credit now has multiple flavors. One is there is some deferred credit on account of non-matching. There will be deferred credit on account of matched credits, which you have claimed, but because you didn't pay them in 180 days, they are unpaid and you are required to reverse. So that again is a deferred credit. So the deferred credit will have two baskets in it. One is unmatched deferred credit and one is unpaid deferred credit. And again, depending on the complexity of the organization, you may have some suspense entries, which you will keep in again a deferred credit. So different types of deferred credits. If you are a multi-locational entity, please be careful because these are different, different baskets. And within each basket, you will have C, S and I and very easily you can make mistakes. So one has to be very, very careful on this entire exercise of differing unmatched credits and differing unpaid credits. Again, you might have other reversals like expense of ratio or credit notes. So that also will have to be taken care of when you're looking at input tax credit. Yeah. You can do that, but the challenge which we have seen in this implementation is that where will you take it? You will have to actually take it back to the expenditure. Huh. So if you first, let's say at the time of booking the expenditure, you are saying, I'll continue with the mediclaim example because it's an easy example to understand. Let us say you take staff welfare debit 100, the input tax rate 18 to bank. This was the entry you passed at the time of expenditure. Now, at the end of the month, when you did a 3B, you taken this entry into block. So you want to pass another entry to say, which is also a perfect entry to say that I will now take this 18 rupees into staff welfare to input tax credit because it is block. The challenge is in a complex organization. When you pass the second entry, understanding that it is staff welfare is a problem. Because you have missed the link. You might have thousands of transactions. For each of the transaction, what was the initial GL code which was hit sometimes becomes challenging. Understanding also the fact that in most organizations, especially if you are on an ERP, you will not have a simple entry like staff welfare to bank. You will have first a GRIR. So you will have a GRIR receivable created. Then you will have a staff, uh, at that time staff welfare is hit. And then you have an entry GRIR, ITC, to bank. Now from that, going back to GRIR and then linking it to the original entry is a practical challenge. So therefore most, especially ERP implementation organizations, take everything at expenditure. They do not prefer, though what you say is accounting wise perfectly correct, but many organizations don't prefer. Then, it's, then it becomes a huge expenditure to be a part of a BNA. 
you, you will be understating your staff welfare expenditure and maybe a many other expenditures like this like again a very specific example would be construction which is ineligible you want to capitalize it okay now if you don't if you treat it the way you did and you put it in a gst expense account you are indirectly treating certain capital expenditure as revenue so that, that that's the larger challenge so two solutions many people have treated straight away as an expenditure and not shown it in gst that is what i understand 50 to 70 percent assesses have done till now now the circular creates a problem a very simple solution which work around solution which we are doing in many organizations is we are advising clients that wherever you are sure that you are not eligible for credit don't flash your gst if you don't flash your gst number the vendor will classify this as b2c it will not come in your gst or 2b at all so this entire circular does not apply so you can tell them and we have seen examples and you talk to them then you can tell them that look i am a gst registered entity but i am not eligible for credit and therefore i don't want to give you a gst number it's not a mandatory requirement unless it is just a supply of goods so maybe somewhere like a construction it can be a little bit of a difficulty but mediclaim and all i'm sure they are not creating difficulties let's look at it practically how many of you flash your gst number when you go to restaurants practically nobody does that yeah No, it's still registered, right? I am procuring it from a registered dealer. It's just not reflecting in my duty. That's it. You have to report, report only expenditure, right? and they are not saying that. I don't think the tax audit report says you have to divide it between uh, two A and other. It says registered and non-registered. So I still procure from the registered dealer. I am buying it from a new national India insurance. It is a registered entity. Sir, continuing with the next. Sure. I have got. You have, have you filed an appeal? Then you claim a credit. So, so where can I show this? You yourself, you will have to write to your officer hmm. that I am not filing an appeal, hmm. and therefore, please issue a PMT three. So no, it will automatically come in your GST. It will automatically get credited in your electronic credit ledger. You don't have to do anything. So I... Later on, again, this becomes a part of your closing balance. So, as you know, in refund applications, opening balances are not eligible. It's only the net ITC addition during the month which becomes eligible. Yeah. So, you'll be stuck with this credit balance. Till the time you have some domestic transaction. No, but suppose I want to write. Ah, that's an interesting point. Write Expensive it writing. Uh, so can I edit to my purchase? So, ah, uh, so. Can I edit to my purchase? In a so again, this is a pure play accounting uh, facet to it, and your question is very valid. What you are saying is you had an ITC balance. Which you filed a refund application, which got rejected. Now you want you have decided that you don't want credit, you don't want refund. Why you decided I don't want to go into that, but you have decided that. So having decided that you want to write it off as an expenditure, so where will you write it off? So I would believe that if you are able to identify the source of the reason of the rejection, you should write write it off to that expenditure. So, for example, it is majorly purchased. The credit eligibility is on account of purchase, so everything will be purchased. But is the refund rejected on account of an ineligible purchase, or is it rejected on account of not denial of export benefit? There are two different facets. It is uh, because late. Ah, so there, therefore, it's not really the purchase which is an expenditure; it's your loss. On account of an administrative failure to file the refund in time, and therefore you can 
so it is a loss just like you when let's say when stock is destroyed by fire you say it's a loss by fire same way this is a loss by a uh, delay in administrative aspect so you write it off as a gst loss these facts will permit you to write it off as a gst loss okay. each fact can be a bit different but your your facts clearly permit you to write it off as a gst loss Sir, but yeah But he is not writing. No, that I said I am not asking why he is not writing. That. It's not actually a loss, but he wants to treat it as a loss. He doesn't want to get it. So I, that's why I started by my caveat to say that I don't know why he doesn't want to take it in either of those two situations. Either file an appeal or claim a recredit in PMT. But he has decided he doesn't want to do either of those. In income tax, you mean to say there could be a challenge there. Yes. Yeah. There's one some question from the back. No, but sir, I I also suggested him the same thing, but he doesn't want to do that. No, DRC three can't be done. There's no DRC three. He has to apply for PMT three year. After PMT three, DRC. But he doesn't want to apply for PMT three. My dear friend, he doesn't want to apply for PMT three. That's a challenge. So yeah, I mean those facts may be a bit different. We'll move ahead. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I think two or three important points. Uh, we would have around fifteen minutes more. Yeah. How much time we have? Fifteen minutes more. Five minutes. More. Okay. So two three important points and somewhere touching this aspect also, I think we'll touch upon is the role of auditor. How conservatism, prudence, one principle which we discussed. Visa is the GST compliance. especially in case of balances credit balances refund receivables and things like that and uh, somewhere we have seen many situations like the example which is said the entity is an export entity there are very small amounts of credits and the entity as a business calls says that i don't want to file a refund the question is is he claiming the credit in the first place? In his GST or three B, is he claiming the credit? If he is not claiming the credit, then they have taken a call that I don't want to even claim a credit. Huh. So there, he is clearly expense. Hmm. Everything even cases will become totally grossed up as expense, like the medical example. Right? It's a simple game. Many entities want to claim the credit, and they do claim the credit also. But because the accumulated credit is only two lakhs or three lakhs. They say, "Yeah, two lakh ka refund file karne ka koi meaning nahi hai." They just want to carry forward electronic credit balance. Now, when the credit carry forward this electronic credit balance, many times auditors question this credit balance on the grounds of eligibility to utilize in the future. Foreseeable future is the word used in one of the accounting standards. So. They say, look, you are a hundred percent exporter, and we face this especially in case of capital goods purchases, because capital goods purchase is not eligible for refund under eighty nine. So, if there is an ITC accumulation on account of capital goods, and if an entity does not have a domestic turnover, auditors at times force them to write off the electronic credit balance. Now, there are multiple facets to this. I would believe the write off. Yes, an auditor is expected to look at multiple facets, but it's not, again, it's not my domain. But I would believe this is a little bit excessive, and it can have ramifications elsewhere. Because moment you write off, naturally the department is going to say you have written off in your books of accounts, so write off in GST or three B also. Otherwise, there is a non-reconciliation between these two documents. Tomorrow there can be some domestic activity. You don't know what is the future. If there is Some possibility of a domestic activity, or at some point of time, some change in the law. Today, the law does not permit rebate in certain cases. 
but let us say that law gets amended slightly and rebate is permitted for this type of anything. It can do one export on payment of tax and claim the rebate. So, how can we with authority conclude that this amount is just a loss? Is a question which one needs to bear in mind. And therefore, then we see that at times there is a conflict between statutory audit process and the GST process also. So, your example is very simple. Don't claim, uh, don't claim credit. If you're not claiming credit, then data will treat it as expense. But if you are claiming the credit but not claiming a refund, then this issue comes. No, no, you're not claimed it. You're not claimed it, so it will not show. To be, and you will show everything as a permanent reversal and closing. Permanent reversal should be. It says the circular says you should do it, okay. though we are not very excited about implementing it. Okay. And uh, but at some point of time, maybe three, four months down the line, we'll have to implement it. As of today, we are not excited about implementing it. Okay. We are saying that this A is practically impossible. Secondly, legally incorrect. Because you can't force me to claim the credit and reverse. Mm -hmm. I don't want to claim it in the first place only. And I that, that's uh, that's my right. Okay. So that's the thought process which we have. So I think uh, let me just see if we are missing out something very, yeah, this is one aspect which I think is an important aspect. We find a reconciliation being done between 2B, matching and books, ITC register and 2B. And at times we just tell the clients, okay, these are the mismatches and action it out. But as auditors, I think this somewhere may also result in an identification of provisions or a need for expense. So as on March, there are entries in your 2B. Yeah, they are not appearing in your books. Maybe that people have not accounted for those transactions. Just you know, so therefore there will be a need for a provision for those expenses unless they are wrong entries in your book. So that is one facet which one may need to keep in mind. Depending on the organizational, because if you are reporting for, let's say if you are doing a quarterly review, it will be quarterly also. If it's an annual review you are doing, then it will be annual. Depending on the size of the organization and the impact of that activity. But this is one pointer which will take you towards making sure that the entity books the correct expenditure or the provisions for those expenditures. Sure. There, this is not relevant. Huh. I think yeah, only I have only two words to answer this question. Educate your client. Yes. That That's all. It does happen. It's a byproduct. <laughs> we used to stop income tax practice, but when in the initial years we used to do at that, that time ATM had come. So when you have to summarize bank statement, there will be 100 rupees withdrawal, there will be 300 rupees withdrawal, there will be 200 rupees withdrawal. Now Summarization becomes all the more complicated. Now So that's, I think it's a sort of, I would say a byproduct or an occupational hazard. One more final aspect, which I will just touch upon is a situation that last two, three years, the department has been very active in terms of identification of fake invoices. And uh, this is something which I always want to talk about at any professional forum, that as professionals, we owe some duty and we have to be very, very careful. In, in a specific topic on this uh, aspect, I always say that there's one, you know, a line, a Lakshman Rekha. As a consultant, as an auditor, there's a line up to which you will step into helping a client and not beyond that. And we are seeing lots of cases where not only the taxpayers are getting arrested, but even professionals are getting arrested. So we have to be very, very careful on that front. Now, understand this from an interplay from accounting perspective. Let us say an entity has done a purchase of one crore rupees and there is, it has claimed an input tax credit of 18 lakh rupees. DGGI investigated them, maybe because the vendor was arrested and he admitted that these are bogus things. 
So he reverses under pressure. This person reverses 18 lakhs of credit. आपने एंट्री पास कर दिया 18 लाख को एक्सपेंस में डाल दिया खत्म हो गया मैं क्या बात वहां खत्म हो गई सो दिस इज वन एस्पेक्ट एज अ स्टैट्यूटरी ऑडिटर आई थिंक इज एन इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट व्हिच वी शुड बेयर इन माइंड इफ योर टैक्स पेयर हैज पेड दिस टाइप्स ऑफ फेक इनवॉइसिंग रिलेटेड एक्टिविटीज अंडर प्रोटेस्ट मेनी टाइम्स देयर मे नॉट बी इवन अ लेटर ऑफ प्रोटेस्ट समटाइम्स दे इवन पे 15% पेनल्टी can you sign an audit report with a caro caro hai na which says no fraud has been committed where voluntarily the tax payer has paid 15% penalty on account of fraud i have seen listed companies balance sheets auditors signing without any commitments this is one thing which i think as professionals we should be very very careful about because clearly the tax payer's conduct itself says that there was a fraud and then if the auditor shies away from this and gives a very clean report there are many ramifications it's not only about the 18 lakhs of credit which is lost whether 1 crore 18 lakhs itself is an expenditure and if it is not a part of cogs what is it a part of should it be treated as a cash balance we take a treated as taken by director so these are larger questions which the auditor will have to deal with we cannot shy away from these questions is the last point which i thought would be relevant from this perspective thank you very much madam chair thank you sunil bhai the point when we started the today's discussions we were just in general we were talking about the reconciliations but after the going through all these slides we came to know there is a reconciliation at, at every transaction level right and wherein the sunil bhai has discuss each and every aspects in a very detailed manner which would now help us to finalize our books of accounts and the financials in a greater way now to propose a hearty vote of thanks i would like to invite ca mavi jain sir and there is one announcement on 27th and 28th of august we are having the national conference on, on the capital markets we have shared the flyers in the whatsapp and in the emails so we request all the members to please register yourself now over to you mavi thank you convener being put a vote of thanks to such a nice speaker and knowledgeable speaker itself is a hard task for me but let me try uh mahesh is said that is a star speaker but i should add one more thing that sunil was the president of bombay chartered accountant society for 2018 and also and presently he is the chairman of indirect tax committee of the same bc society so with, this is one of the more uh relevant aspect about his uh curriculum or we can say fidas uh first when i i am not practicing in gst so i just surprised by the understanding of financial statement in context of gst is there we are generally understanding financial aspect of either investor prospectus or shareholder prospectus but i, I don't know why is a gst but when i heard the things i think is more better to see this as per gst aspects uh, rather than those aspects he has explained the things how the gst indirect tax or gst law differ from the tax laws and every item which we are ignoring while preparing the statutory audit report we have to take care to match the both things otherwise like things we are getting the notice your gst return or is more than your state return over why is not be added your state return over is less than gst why is not be added so it's everything is happening so we should take care 
so mr sunil bhai has explained everything so i put my uh, request you all to just carry a party water thank you very much thank you very much thank you very